dearest God, we've come out here on a Wednesday night to hear your voice, to be nourished and to be fed, God. God, your word is entertaining, but we've not come out for entertainment. We need a touch from a living and loving God. There's so many of us here, God, who really feel like we're on our last breath. We're like that proverbial cat hanging onto the rope and eight and a half lives are gone and there's one little fingernail stuck in that rope. God, please throw us a line. Throw us a line, God. May your word today throw us a line. May those parents that are here receive knowledge and instruction. May those kids that are here receive instruction and wisdom. And may all of us receive from you exactly what you have for us. God, we need you. We are desperately seeking your face. Please be here, Holy Spirit. We invite you to have your way completely. Undivided attention we give to your word this night by the power of the blood of our King. Amen. Amen. Samson. You know, if there was ever a part of the Bible that I struggle with, it's Samson. Samson is like the Hulk. You guys remember the Hulk when he gets mad, Hulk smash? This is, this is Samson. I would venture to say that Stan Lee owes a bunch of royalties <laughs> to the writer of Judges. There's so much in here, I almost don't know where to begin. Samson, again, serving the Lord by day, serving his flesh by night. He's what Warren Wiersbe called the flame that flickered. He was the almost. So sad that some of us see ourselves in Samson more and more and more. Samson is like the coulda, shoulda, woulda. Samson is like in the church, when you're in the church and you see somebody that has so many gifts and so many talents in the first year or two, man, they're really getting it. And they want to serve everyone. You just slow down. Slow. And, you, and before it happens, there's the hook. It's a, a doctrinal bend. It's a, it's a relationship. It's a financial. And you start to see it. And you, and you grab them as a minister. You come alongside and you say, listen. Here's the way this is going to work. Oh, no, 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 no. I read online. I saw here. I saw there. Or my least favorite is when they make us to be cops. And they think that this place is one of those museums for really cool people to hang out. And they walk in and, hey, how's it going, Samson? Everything's great. Everything's great. Great. Everything's great. Great. OK. Great. Samson, I, uh, I heard you married a Philistine. Samson, I heard you, no, 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 everything's great. Man, judge not lest you be judged, you know what I mean? I'm struggling, but I'm good. Just open, let it go. Don't, don't, don't make cops out of us. I'm not a cop, I'm a doctor. I'm not going to tell nobody your business. Won't, you won't find it on the evening news, I promise. Verse 1, chapter 14, as we look, there's so much to glean and learn again. Now Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So he went up and told his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now therefore, get her for me as a wife. Please give me your attention. For you that were not here last Wednesday, Samson is what is called a Nazarite. He took a lifetime vow. His, his parents took a lifetime vow to raise him as a Nazarite. That encompasses three things. One, that you stay away from dead bodies. Two, that you stay away from anything that comes from the grave via wine, beer, so forth and so on. And three, the visual outlook of it is you never cut your hair. So this was a symbol of the bold witness. Not only was it, A, something you chose to do to stay away from dead bodies, not only was it something that you lived by where you didn't drink, but it was something you were bold witness about. Some Nazarites in the Bible that we looked at last week, you had uh, John the Baptist was a Nazarite. He lived his whole life under these things. You're with me. Here was a problem, though. And this is very reflective of many of us here. 
Did you see what he said? Mom, Dad, I've seen a woman and I want her. Why don't you get her for me? Sometimes, especially I see this happen with parents of one child, they wait so hand and foot on their kids, so fearful. Here you had a, a young man. He was the only son of a couple of people who were barren. And when he came, although they made this vow, you see, get me, buy me, want me, gotta have, I need it, I want it, now. And instead of a, a good swift kick in the pants, Okay, 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 I'm going to hold my breath. You're hurting my feelings. That was my daughter's favorite. You're hurting my feelings. I'm about to hurt your feelings a whole lot more than that. Matter of fact, it is your feelings that are going to be hurting around this area. Are you saying you spank your kids? Well, for those that don't know, yes, I spank my kids. But when I spank my kids, it might not be what you think of when you spank your kids. For my kids, and we've done this before, they get spanked with love and understanding the Word of God and a hug. And I tell them, this is going to hurt you a lot more than it's going to hurt me. But the Bible says, if I don't do this, that I hate you. So I love you. Whoa, 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 what did you just say? Yeah, the Bible says that if you spare the rod of your ch on your child, then you hate them. He who hates his son. Really? Here I'd say that instead of going and getting them a wife, they should have went, like my, like my wife's parents used to say, they should have went and got them a switch off the tree and put it on his back. <laughs> you understand me? Continuing. This his father, then his father and mother said to him, There is no woman among the daughters of your brethren or among all my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? The uncircumcised Philistines? I, I don't get it. You've been raised in the church. You've been a, a, a Nazarite your whole life. You know. These people are unclean to God. We must populate the land with those who believe. What do you mean? She's Catholic. What do you mean she's spiritual? Well, she, she you no, know, she, she's like, she goes to church. <laughs> I tell brothers all the time. Remember last week I told you why does a man get married? Anybody remember the answer to that question? Why does a man get married? Anybody? Because God, God told him to. That's right. Now, once you've decided God's told you to get married, what is the first prerequisite that you choose for in a woman? The one thing that you choose in a woman above everything else. I used to work at the racetrack. Growing up, I went to, I went to school in Ozone Park, Queens. I went to a high school called John Adams, which was literally a half a mile from Aqueduct Racetrack. And me and my friends all the time, we cut out of school, climb under the fence, catch the last few races at Aqueduct. I started working there when I was a junior in high school. I was a hot walker and then a groom. Well, the first thing that we learned about horses, when you're choosing a horse, is you take a sheet and you put it over the, sheet, the animal's head. And you lift it slowly. And the way you choose a horse is first by the hooves. If the hooves aren't good, don't matter what the rest of the horse looks like, get rid of it. You follow me? Gentlemen, ladies, singles, you take the horse, you put the sheet over it, and you start to lift it up. What does the hoof of your mate look like first? Any of my brothers here that know that have been around me anytime? What does she got to do? What's, what's the first thing? Hallelujah. She has to love Jesus more than she loves you. He has to love Jesus. You understand that if he worships you, ladies, then he's not worshiping God. If she worships you, gentlemen, yes, it will feel good for a season. But let me tell you what happens. 
you will start to have gravity take its toll upon your body. You will start to become so familiar, almost like coming here to church, and you that have been coming here for more than just a couple of years, how many times have you heard my stories? Oh, now he's going to tell this story, now he's going to tell that story, I've heard all these stories before, why is he going to tell this story again? Just, just 48 years old, I don't have that many stories. <laughs> I'm hopefully getting some more, but it's okay, bear with me. <laughs> And then you've heard all her stories, and you're like, I don't want to talk about that. Now she's going to say this. You ever meet a couple that's been together so long, and you've got to talk to each other anymore? Mm-hmm. 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 What do you want to eat? Wherever you want to eat. How about La Bamba? No. No. Didn't you just say you wanted to eat wherever I wanted to eat? But not there. Balcon de la America is a great restaurant. No, no, we ate that two weeks ago. Okay, where do you want to eat? I said I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> then when you finally come upon the restaurant that she wants to eat at, and you go there, the following week comes, and you say, where do you want to eat? No, no, I'm choosing this time. You chose last time. <laughs> Yes, my daughters, every single Sunday. Daddy, are we going out to eat? Of course we are. And they ask me, where are we going? And what's my answer? Anywhere the queen wants to go. That's where we go. And when that fades, and now the body don't look like it used to, and the mind, well, it's kind of boring to you, what's left? love that she has or he has for the Lord. And that keeps... You think my wife wants to stay married to me all the time, guys? Ladies? I can be a bit on the high-strung side. Hard to believe, I know. She loves Jesus more than she loves me. And let me tell you, and you guys have heard this, you guys that have been here at this church, and it bothers me some days. I want her to worship me. My flesh wants her to worship me. She doesn't. She worships Jesus. And there's always that something missing in our relationship. Praise God there's something missing. It makes me desire her and want her and want to know her all the more because I have not gotten it all. Do you understand? Does any of you married couples know what I'm talking about? When they love Jesus more than they love you, there's ever that wanting. There's ever us. There's ever that Do you know what I'm saying? Hey, married couples, please amen if you hear me. Amen. So, singles, put the sheet over. Lift it up. If she doesn't, he doesn't love Jesus more than you, forget it. Here, Samson is going to get a daughter of the Philistines, the uncircumcised Philistines, those that live for themselves in their heart and their flesh, and continuing on. And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. You want to know the crazy thing? <laughs> the Bible says that Samson was not a man of faith. I'm sorry, let me reiterate that. The Bible says that Samson was not a faithful man, but the Bible says he was a man of faith. This is so crazy to me. Samson is listed in the great hall of faith in Hebrews. Samson. It's always the funniest thing when we start to judge people based upon what we see on the outside and we just don't know. We just don't know what's going on in there. And the, 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 the movement in, of the spirit that God is... Samson to the outside, he looks like such a spoiled brat loser. But something about this man of faith, even though he wasn't a faithful man, continuing. Verse 4. 
But his father and mother did not know it was of the Lord, that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Please give me your attention. Can I make a caveat here? Can I tell you before I explain to you that I have no idea why verse 4 is in the Bible? I can't stand that verse. It throws a monkey wrench into everything that I thought I knew about God. And I love that about God's Word. While I hate part of God's Word, it frustrates me because I don't know it more. Listen to me. Here the writer said that he was of the Lord that Samson had this affinity for the Philistine women because he was moving to judge the Philistines. But here's the crazy thing. In ministry, I have never, ever told anybody to sin so that God's will can be done. Matter of fact, just the opposite. When women come to my wife and say, I'm just in love with this guy, and, and my wife says, no, don't do it. He's of the uncircumcised Philistines. He's not a believer. He's, you know, whatever, whatever. And they always say the same thing. They look at my wife and go, well, look at your relationship. Look what happened with you. And my wife looks at him and goes, Oh, believe me, you don't want to go through what I went through. Do you want to sit at home while your husband is in prison for a year at a time? Do you want to sit at home while your husband is God knows where, doing God knows what, with God knows who? And they all, but no, it worked out for you. But here... Look at verse 4 again. But his father did not know that this was of the Lord, that he was seeking occasion to move against the Philistines. For at that time, it's almost like God said, you know what? And this is crazy. And this might be the only true thing I know about it. That Samson had already chosen to be a vessel of dishonor. You guys know that in the New Testament it says that you can either be a vessel of honor or a vessel of dishonor. That every single person in this world will bring glory to God. Some through good, some, as they say, not so much. Are you with me? Don't understand this verse. Can't wait to get to heaven and, and ask Samuel, what, 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 what did that mean? Are you saying that you knew what he was doing was wrong, but you allowed him to do it anyway? Be Verse 5, so Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. Now I want to ask you a question. What's a Nazarite doing in the vineyards? Nazarite. If you are a modern day Nazarite, some of you know, you heard the story. My son was raised to be a modern day spiritual Nazarite. That all the days of his life, no scissor would come upon the spiritual hair of his head. That I always want him to be a bold witness no matter where he went. And if he chooses MMA, then I want him to be a bold witness, a minister, a missionary in whatever field he goes. I never, ever wanted to hear. Guys, because we are who we are as Calvary chapels, I was 14 years old. Me and my friends went out drinking. And I came home. My father started in on me, and there I was trying to make believe I was straight, but I was, no, you don't know what you're talking about. We have that, my brothers, you ever have that moment in time where you all of a sudden decided, I ain't taking nothing from this guy anymore. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Am I the only one, huh? And you tell dad. And I told my dad, cussed him out, and I threw a punch, and he stepped out of the way and went, bang, <laughs> bang, <laughs> threw me in the bathtub, put the water on me, ripped my clothes off, beat the crap out of me, picked me up, I will kill you before you turn into this, I will kill you. And I promised myself all the days of my life, I never ever want to experience anything like that with my children the breaking of my father's heart. You know, guys, I'm going to confess something to you, and I hope this helps somebody here. I'm not real close with my mom and my dad. And it's, I know it's my fault. I hurt them so much. So much. My young brothers, your parents are flesh and blood. You can only lie and cheat and steal 
and abuse their love just so much. They're human, and they hurt. And I, I assume that's one of the things. I, I was so bad to my parents. I would rob from them. I would steal their anything. And I, I, I warn you guys, be careful. Be careful. Live life now, especially you guys that are over 13. You're a man, and the decisions you make, they impact. Parents, amen to that? Amen. They're just, they're just human. And I raised my son to be this Nazarite. What is a Nazarite doing in the valley of vineyards? He's not supposed to be there. He was not taking his Nazarite vow as serious as his parents were. And the lesson there, guys, please, God has no grandchildren. You have to let your kids live for Christ. And if that means they have to fall on their face, do not rescue them. And take a message, take a lesson from the, um, the story of the wasteful, the prodigal son. The father didn't run after him. The father didn't go get him, didn't go pay his debts. He said, Father, give me my inheritance that's allotted to me. And he said, that's where it's at, huh? Have at it, son. And he gave it to him. And he sat and he waited and he waited and he waited. He didn't rescue him. He didn't pay his phone bill. He didn't pay his rent. He didn't send the money for food. He didn't hit Western Union. He didn't do those things because he knew that he was in God's hands. And he knew, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he's old, he will not depart from it. Or even better, will come back to it. Do you understand that if we keep rescuing our children from the problems, They'll never need God. You parents of younger kids, take this as a lesson. Me as a parent of, you know, 20s and teenagers. Whew. Right now, some of my kids, they might resent me for the harsh and hard way they've been raised. But I know they'll appreciate it as they grow. I know it. I know the Bible says... When your kid grows up, if you didn't spank him, they're going to know you hated them. Let me tell you what I see every single time. Parents, they come to me, they want marriage counseling. We counsel them in marriage. They go get divorced, despite the fact that we told them it will tear the kids up. But all the kids want to go with mom. Why? Because mom will let us get away with anything. And then it's less than two years and they go, we don't want to live with her anymore. Why? They don't even know why. They just want to get away from her because at least they know dad loved them because dad kicked their butt when they needed it. And kids grow up and they, and I do, I'm one of those people who say, mom, how could you let me do that? What were you thinking? So Samson went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vi vineyards of Timnah. Now to his surprise, a young lion came roaring against him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him, and he tore the lion apart as one had torn a young goat, though he had nothing in his hand, but he did not tell his father and mother what he had done. Please, again, give me your attention. I want you to see. Now you're going to start to see in this chapter what happens here, what develops is... is um, um, I forgot the word, but there's, um, when you have these sayings, the sayings are, it'll come to me in a minute. He starts to use these phrases that are familiar language that are not familiar to us. Now watch what I say. It says that a young lion, first of all, he's walking down in the, and a lion comes against him. He's young. You don't know how big or how, but all of a sudden, the Hulk, he comes upon him and he tears it apart. Now the phraseology that he uses there, an idiom, that's the word. It's an idiom used where you ever eaten chicken and you rip a piece of uh, the, the leg off? It's an idiom that the Jews used, that Hebrews used, like to tear the leg off. That's the idiom used there. So he says that he tore it as if you were at a feast and you rip that easy. 
Now again, as somebody who's into the logic and science, this is one of those for me. Tell me about Noah building the ark. Guy built an ark, man, I'm with it. Tell me about people used to live to a thousand years old. I understand that. I can, I can figure out, you know, when the crust was all over the earth and there was no ions, men lived. I have no problem with that stuff. Tell me that a guy died on the cross to forgive me of my sins and every drop. I'm with it. A whole percent. This is my struggle. This, I think the spirit can he beat up a lion. That's weird to me. I faith through it. I'm not saying I doubt it. Please understand. I don't doubt it. It's just I faith through this section of Scripture. Some sections of Scripture you have to faith through. You know why? It's like when you look at a, a, um, a dam. Has anybody ever been by a dam and you see all the holes in the dam? And you think to yourself, wow, that thing could blow at any minute. You're looking at something that you don't understand. For the physics of that dam, keep that water back. And the holes that you see, they're intended to be there for whatever reason the engineers designed. Are you understanding what I'm saying? We're looking at an engineered design. And what we look at as holes, God says, no, I put that there. Why? For those who would believe would believe, and those who would doubt, let them doubt forever. Ooh, that's pretty harsh. I didn't say that. Somebody else said that. Are you with me? So the young lion comes against him. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he tore the lion apart. That's the idiom. He tore it apart as one would have torn apart a young goat at a feast, so to speak. Though he had nothing in his hand, but he did not tell his mother or father what he had done. Now listen to me. That's sig signal and symbol number three. He did not take his Nazarite vow seriously. Not only that, he's a liar. And for you guys, how many of you guys have kids here that are under five? Under five? Oh, isn't it the greatest in the world? Your world revolves around them, and you pick them up, and you put them on, I love you, daddy, I love you this much, I love you a million, million. I can tell you all the things that Kiki and Cammy say to me, I just, I don't want to eat them up. But something happens around six, seven, right? Sometimes even earlier, four or five. Did you eat that? And they got like crumbs in the corner. And I was like, my kid just lied to me. I love that kid so much. Let me tell you, kids are liars, man. Not just a couple of them. Not just a few of them. Like every one of them. <laughs> like every single one of them. You know what I love? Here's the two things that happen. They lie. They know they lie. And they feel so bad they don't want to tell you the truth. It's like, look, don't feel bad. We know you're a liar. We know you're going to lie. Every one of my kids we caught lying. I told you this a few weeks ago. There isn't any one of my kids. We homeschooled all of our older kids. And at one point in time or another, they came to us confessing, I cheated on my homeschool. <laughs> like, wow, that took longer than I thought. And they thought it was the end of the world. <laughs> Honey, I forgive you. Does that mean I don't got to get spanked? No shot. <laughs> no, no, you still get spanked. And then there was Arlie. <laughs> Didn't have to spank Arlie. Because if you spanked, it wasn't enough anyway. She wanted you to draw blood because she knew she did something so wrong. I'm terrible. I'm horrible. She was a very, very emotional child. <laughs> he lied. He didn't tell his mother and father. He just killed a, a lion. And worse than that, watch what happens. Then he went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. And after some time, when he returned to get her, he turned aside to see the carcass of a lion. Behold, a swarm of bees and honey were in the carcass of a lion. He took some of it in his hands and went along eating. When he came to his father and mother, he gave them some, and they also ate. But he did not tell them that he had taken the honey out of the carcass of the lion. You're supposed to stay away from dead bodies, Nazarite. Not only are you breaking your Nazarite vow, but now you're perverting your own mother and father, bringing that crap into their house. How many of you guys did that? Listen, I'm a product of the 70s. I used to steal my father's and mother's drugs and sell them to my friends. 
Never did drugs. I saw my parents. I was rebellious against drugs because I watched my mother and father and brother do drugs. I'm never going to be like you. I'm never going to do drugs. There ain't nothing wrong with pot. Quaalude now and then. Shut up. You don't know. Some of you guys think to yourself, are you serious? Yeah, that's how I grew up. 70s and the 80s. What a time, huh? <laughs> Free spirit. Yeah, hey, have some honey out of the dead lion. I just won't tell you that. So his father went down to the woman, and Samson gave a feast there, for young men used to do so. That's a very, very sad statement. Young men used to give a feast for seven days before they got married. What is a Nazarite doing throwing a drinking party with his friends? Well, it's what men do. Yeah, but you're a Nazarite. And here I want you to see again, parents, it's what they want, it's what he wanted, so that's what we did. We gave our boy what he wanted. But you 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 met Christ, you met God. We looked at last week. If you weren't here last week, man, his mother and father had a one-on-one -on -one encounter with God. And made him a promise. But I love my son. No, you don't. Yes, I do. Listen, how many times I've heard parents say that. My husband is too harsh. My wife is too soft. My husband... Listen, there's a reason God gave us both those hearts. We're supposed to meet somewhere in the middle without getting divorced. 90% of the time, yes, ladies, you're going to do too, too little. 90% of the time, guys, you're going to be a little... They sit in my office and, my husband abuses the kids. And I go, okay, tell me how. Well, he wouldn't throw a seven-day drinking party like Samson. He's a terrible man. He, nah, let's start from scratch. Did he draw blood? No. He mentally abuses them. Oh, stop! I had this argument with my wife some years back when my son was 13. He was 13, he was doing homeschool for the first three hours, at the gym for five hours. She said to me, honey, I think you're working him too hard. I said, he's 13 years old. What do you mean work him too hard? There is no such place. There is no such place. You cannot work a 13-year-old too hard. Oh, but when he comes back from the gym, he's exhausted. He's walking, you lady. He's exhausted unless you tell him his friends are going to come over, or especially if there's video game, then he'll be up all night on the video game. Let me tell you something. The first time you walk in your son's room at 2 o'clock in the morning, because you had to get up to go to the bathroom, and you open the door, and there he is under the cover playing his video game. You lied to me. I trusted you, and you lied to me. And you go in the other room, and you weep, and it happens again and again and again, and you expect your son or daughter to have some spiritual strength to say no to this thing, but you haven't given them discipline. Do you understand why both words are called discipline? When you discipline, it gives them discipline. You can't expect them to have it unless you give it. Samson did not have it because he was not given it. You made a promise to God to raise this child to be a Nazarite. What the heck are you doing throwing a drinking party? Letting him marry some woman of the Philistines. Well, what am I supposed to do? Throw them out of the house. It's hard. You will weep and you will cry and you will beg God for intervention. And everybody that's well-meaning and well-intended will tell you how terrible you are. And somebody will let them stay at their house who claims to be that person. And they will talk bad about you and they will take counsel together and they will. And you'll want to smash. You wish you a Hulk. And you stick to your guns and you be strong. It's the only shot you got, guys. It's the only shot you got. Why? Here's why. I'll never forget when my pastor told me this. I'll never forget. He was teaching this from the pulpit one time and he said, why, if you do all that, 
and they still go astray. And they still choose a life apart from Christ. Because you can't write their book. You could only write your book. And your book at the last chapter, the one that has your kid's name in it, has to say, did all they could do. The Bible is replete with stories of failure parents. King David, a man the Bible says had a heart after God, ruined his kids with the same whatever. Let them be kids. Let them do their thing. He had a son named Absalom who took over, who, who tried to kill him, who slept with his wives and concubines. Why? Because when Absalom needed discipline, he did not give it to him. Look these things up. See if you tell me I'm, I'm, I'm not telling the truth. This is what men used to do, verse 10. Verse 11, it happened when they saw him that they brought 30 companions to be with him. Then Samson said to them, let me pose a riddle to you, if you can correctly solve and explain to me within seven days of the feast, then I will give you 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. Oh, that's great. Let's gamble. Let's add gambling to it. There's nothing in a Nazarite vow about not gambling. Hey, I'm going to pose a riddle to you. If you guys guess my riddle, I'll give you 30 changes of clothes. If not, you give me 30. Great idea, Samson. This man's listed in the Hall of Faith. And I fear to say that this man looks a lot like me each and every day. I hate that. When I first read the Bible, I thought, man, this guy's a loser. And as I started walking with God and saw my un own unfaithful heart, I thought to myself, yeah, he ain't too bad. <laughs> it's not that bad, I mean. I did worse. <laughs> But if you cannot explain it to me, then you shall give me 30 linen garments and 30 changes of clothing. Now, the garment and the change of clothing means it was like the underwear as well as the outerwear. So it was the undergarment and the tunic that went over it, he was, he was saying. And they said, to impose your riddle that we may hear it. Out of the eater came something to eat, and out of the strong came something sweet. Now, for three days they could not explain the riddle, but it came to pass on the seventh day that they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband that he may explain the riddle to us, or else we will burn you and your father's house with fire. Well, nice people you invited to your party, Samson. Philistines, what a wonderful lot they were. Now, I just want you to know, you're going to see in the coming chapters that this is what the Philistines did. We actually saw it in a couple of previous chapters. They burned his house. And remember, even the Jews started, even the Hebrews started to take their, their ways. Remember when they came to um, Gideon and they threatened to burn his house? And then they came to uh, Jephthah and they threatened to burn his house down? And here, this, I guess, was the thing. Now, I want you to see something interesting. When there's no society that is based upon laws... What are they going to do if they did burn his house down? Call the police? God bless you, Jen. Who are you going to call? Ghostbusters? They ain't going to help you. <laughs> it's an interesting thing. And it also lends to why it's so important to be strong. Because as society continues in the breakdown of our morals and the breakdown of our... Listen to me. Arm yourselves and be strong in your house. Because sooner or later, it's a terrible story. I think I told you guys a couple of months ago, the story of a woman who called the police. It was in, I want to say, Utah or Alaska, one of these smaller states out west. She called the police, and they said, she said, there's a man at my door, and he's trying to break in. And she said, do you know him? It's my ex-boyfriend. He's already um, assaulted me. And the woman on the other line said, I'm sorry, we don't have anybody to send. Cutbacks. There's nobody. There's no police on duty. The woman was raped. She was beaten. A couple of days later, they went and arrested the guy, and he got five years. What, what, what are you doing in your house without a gun, woman? What are you doing in your house without something to protect you? Don't be so dependent upon other if you're a single sister here 
I hope you have protection in your house. The Second Amendment gives you the right to be armed so that you are dangerous. Otherwise, what are you going to do? This is society. You're going to call the police? <coughs> when seconds count and the police are minutes away, what are you going to do? Sorry about that. Um, verse 15, but it came to pass on the seventh day, they said to Samson's wife, entice your husband that he may explain the real to us or else we'll burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you invited us in order to take what is ours? Is that not so? Then Samson's wife wept on him and said, You only hate me. You do not love me. You have posed the riddle to the sons of my people, but you have not explained it to me. And he said to her, Look, I have not even explained it to my father or mother. Should I explain it to you? There's so much bad going on in that statement there. <laughs> so much bad. First of all, I think you're marrying the wrong woman. Second of all, if you're going to marry the wrong woman, at least this is why a, a son leaves his mother, mother and father and cleaves, clings unto his wife. Yes, this is going to sound crazy to some of you. Your husband and your wife are number one. Not mama and dada, not babies and children's, your husband and your wife. When you get into a fight with your husband, don't go crying back to mommy and daddy. That won't help you. You think at first it will, but in the end it will cost you. For this reason, a man shall leave his mother and father. I didn't even explain it to my mother and father. Why don't you tell her why you didn't explain it to your mother and father there, Samson? Um, because I'm supposed to be a Nazarite, and um, I'm a lying, cheating, drinking, gambling idiot. You know, it's the funniest thing, and I've seen this happen. I'll see a brother, he'll meet this woman who's not a believer, we tell them, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. They come to get premarital counseling, even though she's not a believer. And you know what I find out? She's marrying the wrong guy because she's a doll. <laughs> Sister, you sure you want to marry this guy? <laughs> this might be a mistake for you. Then they come to church. They fall in love with Jesus. They get crazy for the Lord. They don't want to have premarital intercourse anymore. They fall crazy in love with the church and with God and everything that's the Lord. And the brother's like, why, why, did, you, why did I bring my girlfriend here to you? You're bringing her to me. You brought her to Jesus. Don't get mad that she fell in love with Jesus. I'm leaving. I told you you were marrying the wrong guy. I just thought that she was marrying the wrong. Wow. Ministry's fun, guys. <laughs> Thank you. Now, she had wept on him for seven days. My goodness. That ain't nothing. <laughs> I got that beat. Hey, does anybody here go on eBay? <coughs> eBay is like the perfect women thing. My wife borrowed my eBay account. I sell stuff on eBay. And it sends me like an update every five minutes of stuff my wife picked out. You've been outbid. You've still been outbid. Just in case you forgot, you've been outbid. You have it. I won something the other day and I said, honey, did I win a new Pilates gym? <laughs> yes, you won it. I won it. If I won it, how did I pay for it? Well, you won it because other people wanted it. Constant. I'm telling you, I'll go in there and there'll be three messages from eBay. Oh, and then after you've been outbid and you lose it, hey, another one came up here. And another, well, my wife said this was the only one. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Or am I just the only one on eBay? And it happened on the seventh day that he told her because she pressed him so much. Then she explained the riddle to the sons of her people. So the men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, 
what is sweeter than honey and what is stronger than a lion. And he said to them, if you have not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. Now, they cheated theoretically, right? Theoretically, they cheated. So I guess he's justified when verse 19 happens. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down to Ashkelon and killed 30 of their men, took their apparel, and gave changes of clothing and those who had explained the riddle. So his anger was aroused, and he went back up to his father's house, and Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been his best man. Okay. <laughs> I love the culmination. Remember, I want you to see the difference. Turn back one page to chapter 13. Look at verse 24. So the woman bore a son, called his name Samson. The child grew, the Lord blessed him, and the Spirit of the Lord began to move upon him at Mahana Dan between Zorah and Eshtoal. Some culmination. And we looked and we rejoiced and we said, Amen. You remember last week? Amen. Now, look at the culmination of, of just one chapter away, just a few years later. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him mightily, and he went down to Ashelon, killed 30 men, took their clothes, gave it to the men that he gambled with. And then his anger was aroused. He went back to his father's house. Samson's wife was given to his companion, who had been his best man, probably the guy that solved the riddle by plowing with his heifer, whatever that means. <laughs> So they explain it. He gets him the garments and he says, you know what? Fine. I'm leaving. I'm going to stomp my feet and go back to my mommy and daddy. How long have I been going, bro? Drew. Hi, Drew. Hi, how are you? How long have we been going? 47 minutes. Okay, I'm not going to do chapter 15 then. <laughs> hey, um, glean the lessons. Take your, take your child rearing seriously, man, because uh, when you see the things that happens over the next few chapters with Samson, it's serious, guys. There is no greater broken heart. Watch this. How many, anybody here have an adult child that is wayward from the Lord? Why don't you look around. Ladies, is there anything that, that consumes your thoughts more? Is there anything that breaks your heart more? Is there anything that makes you feel like a failure more? Is there anything that you wish you could do anything? If there was one thing I could choose in my life to do different, this would be it. My brothers and my sisters, it ain't no joke. It ain't no joke. Samson is a perfect example of what can happen when a kid who has got so much talent. I was one of those kids in school where the teachers always said to my parents, he's so smart if he would only apply himself. You know, your kid is hyperactive. Didn't know that 10 years later they'd call it ADHDHBHBS. <coughs> Close your Bible. I make it light. I try to make it a little light because I know that the, a study like this can make you feel like a real failure. You know, I mean, there's so much in there. There's so much in that chapter. Listen to me. Don't look backwards. There's a reason God didn't fix a rearview mirror on the front of our forehead. Our eyes are forward. There's none in the back of our head. God doesn't care where you've been. He cares where you're going. You parents here that have done what you think is failure, you're here today. Leave it go. Nail it to the cross. Walk forward. For some of you, it's just a matter of prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting. For some of you, it's, you know what? My kid's six, seven, eight, ten years old, and I ain't been doing it right. If you need help, I've got six kids. Lee's got four kids. I mean, Matt's got a, he's a single, a parent of one kid. You've got leadership here. Yeah, Mr. Yancey's got four kids, and he does how many of our kids at base one? Talk to us. Don't bear it alone. Don't carry it alone. If you know your kid is going bad, and listen, if you have a kid in youth group, 
talk to Pastor Austin. We see these things coming from a mile away. I could tell you stories of kids that were in this church that Austin was a pastor to five or six years ago, and he sat down with their parents and he said, look, your kid's going bad, you need to do something. How dare you say that to me? How dare? And they stomp out and they take their kid and they never come back to youth group or they take their kid and never come back to church. And now their kids, and I can name a half a dozen of them for you, they're drugs, jail, prison, pregnancies. Listen, my young brothers, listen what I tell you. Alcohol will drown your dreams. Drugs will burn your dreams. And a pregnancy will steal your dreams. You hear me? You hear me, young brother? You hear me, young brother, what I said? What I say? I said alcohol will drown your dreams. Drugs will burn your dreams. And sex outside of marriage, especially a pregnancy, will steal your dreams. You know that now. You've been forewarned and you've been forearmed. We are here to help. Let's learn from the lessons that Samson and his parents have taught us. Raise our children to be Nazarite. It's an, it's an awesome responsibility and task. Oh, but it takes some work. Listen, if you're one of those parents that thinks, are you kidding me? A kid? Another kid? I can't handle the ones I got. I'm with you. I, I, I mean, I'm thinking to myself, Cammie's 20 years old. I'm going to be close to 70. If I got to... <laughs> Let's pray. <laughs> pray. <laughs> Father, we pray. Give us the wisdom and the strength and the understanding and the knowledge and the know-how to raise these children well. God, thank you so much for Samson's faith, but for not his failure, God. We don't want our kids to fail. God, for us that are parents here, we need the truth of your word. We need the truth of counsel, God, to wage this war. If there is one parent here, and they know, and God was speaking them tonight, and they just need help, God, help them. Use the people that are in this room to help each other. God, may your word God, your word is so perfect and true. We believe that if we raise our children up, they'll never depart from your word. God, for those of us here, God, I pray for my sisters who are, who are weeping and wailing for their lost children. Comfort their hearts to know that you are in complete control. And even as we read in verse 4, that verse that is so hard to understand that you're using this as an occasion to bring glory to your name. And how you're going to do it, we don't know, God. So we surrender our children to you. May we be strong and not lazy. May we find ourselves not being outwitted or outthought or even out-hustled by our children, God. Oh, I hate to even say that. God, may our kids not outlast us. May they not weary us with their troubling. But may we each and every day be given, as your word says, new mercy. And God, for my young brothers and sisters here, God, may this warning be a siren in their ears. May they be set free. Deliver them, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for hearing our prayers. We need you desperately because we cannot do it alone. In Christ Jesus we ask. Amen. Amen.